Personal computers have two processing devices, the CPU and the GPU. Most applications run on the CPU, the central processing unit, and then send display information to the graphics processing unit, or GPU. But the GPU can do much more than just display pixels. It's optimized for building 3D scenes using OpenGL shapes. Here's a simple patch showing how it all works. The virtual 3D world is called a context. In this case, the context is named GL Quick Start. We view the shapes in the context in a named jet.window. The view through the window is calculated by the jet.gl.render object with the same name as the window. There are two jet.gl objects drawing shapes in this context, a jet.gl.model, which loads a .dae file, and a jet.gl.videoplane, which receives jitter matrices as frames of a QuickTime movie. Both objects create a type of shape in the context. At first, there's nothing in the window. When we bang here, the trigger object sends an erase message, bangs the counter and the movie, and then bangs a render. So here is one frame of the DV Ducks movie, oddly scaled against a gray background. So where is the other shape? Let's turn on the Q Metro. Oh, so we didn't see the big yellow duck because it was positioned outside our view. To get a feel for the depth of the context, let's use this jit.gl.handle connected to the video plane and rotate the center of the plane with a cursor. Okay, that's lots of fun, but now let's break it down to see what happens each time the Q Metro bangs, starting with the erase message. We disconnect its patch cord and old pixels persist, messing things up. Undo. So each render starts by erasing the previous render. The next bang goes to a counter and a position message which tells the model to move through space. The bang also goes to the qt.movie object to output a frame of video which is then displayed on the surface of the video plane. Since GL objects send their data to the render object automatically, the second bang usually goes only to non-GL objects. Finally, a bang is sent to the jet.gl.render when all the objects have drawn their shapes in the 3D world as viewed from the camera position, the jet.gl.render sends the 2D view to the jet.window, where it can be displayed with a projector, for example. To work well in 3D space, we need to have a clear idea of how position is calculated. Disabling the Q Metro bang to the counter and controlling the position manually with an atchery object, we see that X goes from minus 5 to 5, left to right, and y goes from minus 3 to 3, bottom to top. The numbers represent the width and height of the scene from the camera's location. In this case, the camera is 8 units distance from the center of the virtual space, the origin. Although there is no standard distance unit in OpenGL, using meters can simplify working with other 3D software, like Max's physics objects. Adjusting the camera's Z value, we can move closer and farther, even seeing behind the scene, with negative values going towards the background and positive values towards the foreground. Note that changing Z will change the appearance of X and Y. Why? Because these position numbers represent horizontal and vertical position at a certain camera distance. Moving things farther makes them smaller. Here with Z at minus 20, the duck is still visible with X at minus 15. Using one Q Metro to drive the whole patch and doing each calculation only once is the most efficient way to calculate frames and usually good practice. However, in this case, our animation uses a counter to count the render bangs and move the duck through space. Unfortunately, if the rendering frame rate changes, so does the speed. One solution is to control the position with audio. In this patch, we take a phaser tilde signal, scale its maximum value from 1 up to 2 times pi radians for a complete revolution, and then set the radius to a constant 3. We then feed these values to the pull to car tilde object. Converting to Cartesian coordinates, we get the x and y values for a circular path, and the movement is independent of the frame rate. As you can imagine, Using audio data to control OpenGL objects opens up a lot of possibilities. Just for fun, let's duplicate the whole patch to
to create a second duck. We offset the phase by 0.5 to keep them on opposite sides of the circle. We can now slow down the phaser to zero so we can stop and observe the surface of one of the ducks. Let's attach an attribute to turn off the smooth shading attribute. See how it's broken up into planes? The positions of the vertices determine the shape of the object. Although the vertex locations can be stored in a jitter matrix, in this patch, the yellow duck has its vertex and surface information stored in a .dae file. Enabling smooth shading for our duck interpolates between the planes to give a smoother surface. Here's another way to set the surface appearance. Let's create a grid shape with its default values. Without lighting and surface effects, it looks flat. We can modify the surface of the shape by attaching a jit.gl.material object. This actually adjusts several attributes at once, and if we double-click it, we see lots of options. Dirt wall is my favorite. Finally, we can texture the surface of our sphere by using the jit.gl.texture object. This takes a frame of video, formatted as a jitter matrix, and converts it to an OpenGL texture, which can then be mapped onto any surface. Notice how the texture patch cords look different. Actually, the video looks a little dark. Let's change the default value of GridShape's color attribute from 0.5 to 1. There, that's better. Conveniently, the jit.gl.videoplane object does the work of these two objects. First, converting the incoming jitter matrix to a texture, then scaling the color and mapping it onto a flat shape. Once the frame is converted to a texture, we can process it by inserting a jit.gl.slab object. By default, it doesn't do anything, just passing the texture through. Using either the file attribute or the file message, we can load a bit of OpenGL code wrapped up in a .jxs text file. Let's look at Cycling74, Jitter Shaders, Color, and select a file that simulates Jitter's Bercosa object. There are some powerful code examples included with Max, and you can make and share others. Parameters can be changed with a param message, followed by the name of the parameter and its value. Now we are controlling brightness using the GPU. We've just scratched the surface of Max's OpenGL world, but now you're ready to play with help files and examples. When you first look at a patch, start by locating the QMetro, the jit.gl.render, and the jit.window. Usually there's a context name, or you can leave it out and Max will generate a unique name. Next, locate the various objects like video plane and grid shape, which create shapes in the context. The other thing to look for is an overall flow of video and other data from jitter objects to OpenGL objects. Once large amounts of data have been passed to the GPU, it's best to stay there all the way to the video output. Welcome to the world of do-it-yourself motion graphics.